Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. This is Trucking with Authority. I'm your host, Kenny Long, and for the next hour, consider me your navigator on your journey to success. We could talk about anything tonight from getting started in the trucking industry to setting goals, writing your business plan, buying your first truck and leasing to a carrier, getting your own authority, dealing with FMCSA, record-keeping requirements, insurance requirements, pulling freight under your own authority, finding that freight, working with brokers, load boards, sales and marketing to try to find that direct freight, direct shippers, those direct customers. We can talk about the accounting side of it, billing those customers. That's something that I think uh, a lot of people have some questions on, billing those customers, getting your money, getting paid. Which brings us to factoring, another hot topic we always talk about here on the show. If you have any questions, comments, anything you'd like to add, this is the show to do it. We have a lot of calls on the line already. I do not have a call screener tonight, so I'll be calling out the numbers, uh, the area code first. And that's how we'll be screening the calls tonight. So if you hear your area code, we'll bring you on the air. I will get to everybody that we have on the line by 8 o'clock, and we'll, as always, go into overtime. We already have some questions on the line, so go ahead and press one now. We're getting to the calls on the phones first, and then if we have time, we'll get to some of the Facebook questions and comments. If any of you are watching now, go ahead and share this Facebook stream out. And let's get as many viewers as possible. Tonight, I want to talk about freight, the rates, the trends rates, negotiation, and how all that works together. There's a lot going on in the freight market right now. The economy is doing some really weird stuff. Uh, we're watching the stock market explode, which means people are spending money. Businesses are spending money. Investors are putting money into things now, which means they're buying equipment. They're hiring employees. They're building factories, which in our industry means they're shipping products again. That's a good sign. We're already seeing it. I posted uh, an article on Facebook, uh, it's probably almost been two weeks now, but the flatbed segment is almost a, a month ahead of schedule on the trends. I've been reading some articles that from a year ago, the volume of freight is up almost 100% huge gains in volume in the market that's great news for us in the trucking business when there's a lot of loads to ship that means business is good for us we are one of the first indicators of the economy so when we start seeing upticks like we're seeing now we know that good things are around the corner as always there's a lot of question marks there's a lot of things politically that could change. There's a lot of uh, business regulations that could affect us. A lot of things will affect us in a good way. A lot of things will affect us in a negative way. Some of the things that could go either way is things like the ELD mandate. Things like hours of service changes. Of course, there's a lot of regulations just on business in general. So. If you have any questions or comments tonight, if you're on the line, go ahead and press one. We will get to all of the calls. Now, there's some things that I've, I've noticed over the past few weeks. Freight trends have been untypical. They have been way above average, especially in certain segments and certain areas. But the rates and the negotiations are not following that trend. And there's some reasons why. I want to talk about that tonight. So if you have any questions or comments about what you're seeing out there as far as freight, as far as the market, let's discuss that. Now, I am not going to talk about specifics as to certain lanes or rates. That's what RICO does tomorrow. And I highly recommend, if you are not already doing so, Wednesday nights, Rates and Lanes with RICO Muhammad, the market is... 
I think crazy things are about to start happening in the freight market. It's a great time to be in this business, but you have to stay on top of it. You have to have that information. That's one of the things that, I, that seems to be affecting the market right now is a lack of information. So if you're listening to me now, get out there and start studying the markets. Start looking at the trends. Look at the supply and demand. There's a lot of indicators for what's happening right now. And I encourage all of you to stay right on top of all of that because it will help your bottom line. So if you are watching on Facebook, go ahead and share this out. If you are listening to the show, go ahead and press 1 and we will get you on the air. Let's see if we can... And I see, John, you are watching. If you could do me a favor, John, share this out with, uh, with everybody and put something in all the groups. I don't have an assistant today. Elizabeth is uh, out on the road conducting some business, taking care of some of our owner operators, so she's helping us out. All right. Here's what I'm seeing. There is a, a big demand for trucks right now. In some cases, my phones are ringing off the hook big time in the flatbed segment. For sure but also in certain markets there's a big demand also for the van segment and of course reefer is right along there with it there is demand for trucks demand like we haven't seen since 2014 now 2014 if you were around in this industry then you understand that 2014 was a record-setting year now if you're fairly new to this business chances are you base your business plan on what you heard about 2014. 2015 and 2016 were very tough if that's what the case was. 2014 was phenomenal. Uh, here we are in 2017 and I'm still talking about it. It was that good. We're looking at those trends now. In some cases I think it will be even better. Fuel prices are still fairly low. That's one thing that's different from 2014. Fuel prices in 2014 were we're quite high, uh, bumping $4 a gallon. We're in the $2.50 a gallon range right now. That's a pretty big spread and a lot of money on the fuel surcharge. But I've read articles that showed the cost of fuel and the effect on the economy. For every one penny in average cost of fuel per gallon, especially gasoline, but per gallon overall, $1 billion gets pumped back into the economy. So we are $150 billion more into the economy right now than we were just a few years ago. That's a good thing. So while we may not be capitalizing on the fuel surcharge money, that means there is more freight out there. There will be more spending because they will, uh, the consumers will have that money to spend. That's a good thing for us. We'll get it on the backside. I know many of you listen to me, your, your Kevin Rutherford followers, and you, you want to see that fuel surcharge spike. And that's that if, you're, if you are taking advantage of great fuel economy and you are taking advantage of the high fuel surcharge, that's fantastic. But understand how the market works and that the fuel surcharge being lower means fuel prices are lower, which means consumers have more money to spend elsewhere. When they're spending elsewhere, there's more money for us uh, on the line haul rates which is a good thing more more freight means more work more work means more demand more demand means higher rates typically now i'll say typically because i'm seeing something a little different this year and i think i have some ideas as to why and i'd like to hear your ideas as well so if you could if you have any questions or comments about the freight market what you're seeing i want to hear what you have to say so go ahead and call in the number. If you're watching the stream on Facebook, call in to 563-999-3001. That's 563-999-3001. It's at the bottom of the screen. Call that number. Press 1, and we will get you on the air. I would love to hear what you are seeing out here with the freight market. What rates are we seeing? How are the negotiations with brokers? And if you're working with direct shippers, what are they expecting? Now, that last comment, I think, has a lot to do with, with what's happening in the market. What are shippers expecting? 
Now, I've talked extensively about the market as far as the ELDs and how that could affect things in the future. And I, I know that a lot of shippers, the warehouse type shippers that move a high volume of freight that watch the market, that watch the transportation industry, they are well aware of the ELD mandate. They are well aware of what's coming. So that said, they understand how it could affect the market and they're trying and they have been trying for some time to lock in on some contract rates. It's been predicted for well over a year that 2017 would see a spike in freight rates. Now, shippers that do a, vo a high volume of, uh, of freight shipments have to control their costs. Now, here we are as carriers, and we get focused on what our businesses are, but remember, the shippers are out there to save money for themselves. They need to get their products to market as cheaply as possible so that they can maintain their advantage in the market, in their market. So if they're selling widgets, they need to be the best priced and the best uh, volume widget out there, which means shipping costs cannot put them out of, out of business. We're in a market right now where they're trying to capitalize on what we've seen over the past couple of years. So, over the past couple of years, we have seen shippers pushing to lock into contract rates. We've seen shippers pushing to lock in long-term, lower contract rates. They're trying to control their costs long-term to steady the market. Now, 2014, as good as it was for the carriers, as good as it was for drivers, truckers, it was horrible for shippers and for brokers. Now, some of you, I, I know I just said brokers, you don't care. Yeah, fantastic. It, it hurt brokers, that's great. It's not great for us as carriers because we do, as much as many of you hate to admit it, this industry relies on brokers because brokers are the salespeople of the industry. Most of you one, two, ten truck operators, if you don't have a salesperson on staff dedicated just to find you freight, all they do is find you freight all day long and you pay that person just to find you freight. If you don't have that, a broker is your best friend. Now I had a conversation with somebody some time ago, another carrier, that said that he would like to find an, a former broker, an ex-broker, somebody maybe that was retired that had a great book of business that just wanted maybe some cash on the side. And he said, what I would like to do is hire this person just to make sales calls for me and lock in some contract freight. As a carrier, and this was a small, extremely small, just one truck actually, lock in some freight for me to carry, just my one truck carrier, because I know that a broker that has a good book of business would love to give me their contacts just to lock in this one truck to carry it. And for doing so, this carrier thought that I would give them a one-time fee. I would, he would be willing to give them several thousand dollars of one-time fee. If you don't already see where there's a problem in this logic, let me explain. That is what freight brokers do. And they don't get a one-time fee. Freight brokers make these sales, they move freight for a long time, long-term contracts. And every load that they move, they get a commission on. It's not just a one-time deal. So you have to understand that that is exactly what freight brokers do. There's no reason for a, a freight broker, a salesperson, or so forth, to lock in a one-time contract for a single truck carrier when they could lock in huge volumes of freight doing the exact same job. So. You have to understand the relationship that we have here. And sometimes that is where carriers lose their focus. So I want to talk more about freight and rates and the volume and, and what we're seeing. If you have any questions or comments, please, by all means, I'd love to get you on the air. We do already have some questions, uh, hands raised here, and I'll bring you on in just a moment. Let's see if we can... 
get the word out here. I usually have some assistants in the other room helping me out. Uh, I'm trying to run the run the board and run the phones and run everything all myself today, so I'm trying to keep on top of it all. So bear with me, excuse me. All right, so John is already on, streaming here on Facebook. He says that his carrier has seen a 56% increase in contract volume in 2017 so far over 2016. 56% increase. That's huge. And that leads right into what I was talking about. Shippers are pushing to get these contracts locked in now with the rates that they can because they, they have to stabilize themselves to make sure they're protected from huge spikes in the market. Now, when you have a large carrier like John works for, they have the capacity to handle possibly all of the freight coming out of those, these uh, facilities for the entire six months or year term that this contract might lock in. For those of us on the spot market, we have to look at brokers. Brokers are doing the same thing. Now, understand the broker business model. It's important that everybody understands the broker business model. And I can pretty much promise you that if you have not been a broker or have not studied being a broker, if you've never actually brokered a load, chances are you probably don't understand the broker business model. I've tried to explain it. I thought I had a pretty good grasp of it myself. And I've talked to a lot of brokers. I've studied it. And it wasn't until I became a broker myself, which is just very recently, and I've only brokered a few loads so far, just things that I couldn't handle with my own carrier, with my own trucks. I have seen a huge, a whole new world that I didn't realize. And carriers are at a huge disadvantage. And unless you can lock in and understand what you are doing with brokers and understand how to negotiate, you are at a disadvantage. You have to understand what the brokers are up against. And that's what I want to get into a little bit now. Let me take this call that we have on now. If you have any questions or comments. And if you haven't already, John, if you could share this out in all the groups. I know I mentioned it already, but if you could share this out, that would be great. I haven't had a chance to do that myself. Let's go to the caller, 928, 928 area code. How can I help you? Nine, Hello? Yes, 928. Yes. Welcome to the show. How can we help you? Yes, yes. I'm trying to apply I'm trying to apply for my US DOT and MC number. Okay. Because of the exact same thing that you just said. I've been seeing I've been looking I have access to the low board and you know, right now it's starting to do a little change on the market and I kind of see a little bit. That's why I'm trying to get to my own, you know, get my own authority. Okay. All right. So, and what is your question on that? I know, uh, I know last time I talked, uh, you mentioned that on your Facebook, you had the link where to apply at. Yes. So, so I, I, I looked in there and I couldn't find them. Okay. What you need to look for, and FMCSA has been changing some things around. But all the links last time I checked uh, should all still be relevant. They might take you to a, an old, outdated page, but it, it'll update automatically. So where you find that is I, there's a Trucking with Authority page as well as a Trucking with Authority group. Now, in the group, you can have discussions. You can post your own uh, discussion and questions and so forth, where the page is more just to, to advertise this show. Find the group, and when you go oh, to, okay. when you go to the group, uh, Facebook group, and you have to do it from a computer. You can't do this from your phone. If you do it from a computer, there on the left side of the screen in the group, you will see a link for files, and in the files section, it will pull up. You know, anytime anybody has posted anything, uh, Excel spreadsheets or Word documents and so forth, in that section early on, a couple of years ago now, I posted a file. It's a PDF of the checklist, step-by-step -step instructions on how to apply for your authority, and there are the links to all the websites that you need for that. Okay. All right. Now, if you can't uh, find it, all right. let, I can tell you right now where to go. 
fmcsa.dot.dot.gov. fmcsa.dot.dot.gov. Right in the center of the page, there's a link for carriers, and then you follow the link to get. Uh, I think I need a DOT number. I think it's a question stated like that. I think I need a DOT number, and you'll click on that, and it will take you into a, a questionnaire. I did this just a couple of days for someone. I walked somebody through this, uh, and it is very simple. It, if, and let me to make sure you understand, what you are applying for is you are applying to be a carrier conducting interstate commerce, interstate commerce, carrying property that belongs okay. to other people, and you're doing it for money, for compensation. If you understand those questions, if you can answer that, this questionnaire will ask you very verbatim, you know, step by step, what you are doing and what your, your business will be. You are a motor carrier transporting other people's property for money across state lines, interstate. And it will automatically give you all of the okay. following information and, and forms that you have to fill out. Okay, and it's very it's a, it's almost a cartoon. You click on the picture, you click on the dot, yes or no, and you type in the information. You give them your three hundred dollars, and it will spit out the USDOT number, and uh, immediately go ahead and file your BOC three forms. And in a couple of weeks, you can file for your insurance, bind that all, and you will go active. Already, okay. so that uh, USDOT is three hundred bucks, and uh, MC number. The DOT number itself is is absolutely free. Now, if you are not conducting interstate commerce, you do not need an MC number. All you would need is a DOT number. So that is absolutely free. Okay. If you're crossing state lines for money, then you need an MC number or authority. And the MC number is going away. They haven't quite phased out that program yet, but the MC number is going away. It will all be linked to the DOT number. So to get your authority will cost you $300. All right. All righty then. All right. So does that answer all your questions? All right. Yeah, no, that's it. All right, fantastic. Now, after you get your authority, you do have to, just as a reminder, file your UCR, which is through the state of Indiana. That's a state-run system, which basically takes the federal information, spreads it out to all the states so they recognize you. And that will be $76 for the single truck operation. You also need to file for any states that you happen to be running through, mainly New York, Kentucky, New Mexico, or Oregon. You'll have to file permits. They do a weight distance tax there. Any other states where you do intrastate work, especially the bigger states where it's very common, such as uh, California or Texas, and I also recommend Illinois, you absolutely have to register to get a separate DOT number with those states. And most of the other states, as a matter of fact, all of the other states except for three, which is Florida, Arizona, and I believe Tennessee is the third one, all of the other states have some type of individual state requirements as well. You either have to register through DOT in the state or you have to register with that state's division of taxation. Some of them require you to register if you are picking up and delivering within the same state. Some of them require you to register if you pick up or deliver in the same state. Now, the states I can name offhand that have that the latter is New Jersey and Pennsylvania. If you conduct any business with shippers or receivers, shippers or receivers in Pennsylvania, doesn't matter where the load either picks up or delivers, whatnot, if either one of those, shippers or receiver, is in the state of New Jersey or Pennsylvania, you have to register with the, the uh, Division of Taxation in those states. So. Those are the two that are the strictest, but most other states have some requirements. So again, New York, or I'm, I'm sorry, New York, Kentucky, New Mexico, and Oregon, absolutely for sure you have to register because they check and they, uh, if you get stopped in, at the border crossing or port of entry, you will be held up until you get registered with the State Department of Taxation. Uh, if you can drive through the states whatsoever at all. Doesn't matter where the load picks up or delivers. Absolutely, if you drive through those states, you owe that tax. That's in addition to any IFTA tax, by the way. In addition, that's a completely separate tax. Those four states, you absolutely have to register. If you conduct business in 
most other states, namely New Jersey and Pennsylvania, you have to register with the Division of Taxation. And if you pick up and deliver within the same state, intrastate work, most other states have a requirement there as well. I highly recommend Texas, Illinois, and California right off the bat, and any others that you may conduct business in uh, on a regular basis. So if you have any more questions or comments on that, feel free, press 1, and we, I will get to those questions as well. All right, so freight volumes. This is all about the trucking industry. Freight volumes are up. They are skyrocketing, and they're going to be up higher and higher. The economy is on an upward swing right now. More people are spending money. There's more freight to be shipped. Regulations are cracking down, which will be cutting back supply of trucks, which means the demand is going up. Supply is going down at the same time, which means rates should follow. It's already happening. Rates are not, are not spiking nearly as fast as the supply and demand. The question is, why is that? And that's because a lot of brokers have bid on these, and, and carriers as well, but brokers have bid on contracts long term and they honestly when you are negotiating with them and they say I don't have any more money in it this is all I've got in it in many cases that is absolutely true now I said all of that and I've been talking about all of that for the past half hour to say this I absolutely hate the bumper sticker that says say no to cheap freight I've talked about that numerous times I can't stand the term cheap freight I don't think there is such a thing as cheap freight the uh, concept of say no to cheap freight, I, I just can't. I just can't stand it. But say no to cheap freight, and I can't believe I'm even saying that. But say no to cheap freight. What I mean by that is, so you are in demand right now as a carrier, as a truck driver. You are in demand. You have the leverage. Now, in some segments, the van segment is still a little soft. Reefer segment is just average. Flatbed is, is really good right now. As we go into the, the spring and into the summer, all of these different segments, every truck out there will be in high demand. Uh, it's, uh, the, the numbers are already showing it. The trends are already showing it. We will all be in high demand. That being said, do not accept a low rate. Now, I was reading some of the... I get a lot of my... Uh, feedback for the show and a lot of inspiration and, and things I want to talk about just from some of the Facebook groups, some of the, the rates groups, rates and lanes and uh, all these different, uh, tr the trucking with authority group that we talked about. <coughs> I get a lot of information and feedback questions and I, I love reading some of these comments. Now I talk a lot about negotiation and I know there are a lot of people that follow me closely when we talk about negotiation. I was reading a comment earlier today that said they called on a load and the, the broker gave them a price, and they simply turned around and said, thank you, have a nice day. That was that. What kind of negotiation is that? I, I have to ask you, what kind of negotiation is that? Everything is negotiable. I also wrote an article last week because there's been so much discussion about rates that are posted on a load board. Anytime a rate is posted on a load board, I can tell you it is absolutely negotiable. So... I can give you some experience. Now, I told you I've been a broker now for a month and six days. My authority went active uh, February 1st. So in that month, I've moved a few loads, and I've been experimenting with load boards. And I posted a load on the load board, and I explained this in my article. If you'd like to read it, you can find that. I posted the links on all the groups on Facebook. But I posted a load without a rate early in the week. Now, I had a couple of weeks to move it. The customer was not in a big rush, but I wanted to try this out. I had plenty of money on the load. It was a good load. I'm not going to give rates right now, uh, but I can just give you the generic uh, backstory here. It had a good rate on it. I posted the load willing to give. Now, this uh, remember, I'm a carrier primarily, and I use my brokerage. Uh, my, all my customers go through my brokerage first primarily to support my carrier. So I can get these direct customers, but I can promise them service. So 
My goal was only to satisfy the customer. I wasn't trying to make a killing on this load. wasn't trying to do anything like that. I was simply trying to take care of the customer. That being said, I was willing to give 100% of the freight rate, 100% of what the customer pays me. Because I wasn't trying to make money. I'm not, I'm, the broker side of my business is not where my cash cow, the carrier side is. I just have to take care of the customer. So willing to give 100%. Posted this load with, with no information except for where it picks up, where it delivers, equipment type, and the, and the basic load board stuff. The first day, no calls. I didn't really expect a lot of calls. I'm a new broker. It, it shows. I don't really have a credit rating yet. I don't have anything. No big deal. Set that afternoon, I kept refreshing it. Next day, I posted it again. No calls. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday went. Now it's Thursday. Now I've had all week to move it. And the customer wasn't in a rush, but now it's starting to become a priority because they will need it by the next week. So I decided, let me try this. And I posted it with a rate. And I posted it with a rate that was below market average. Fair, but below market average. And I did that on purpose because I thought, as a carrier, when I call on these, I negotiate. So I threw out, as a, a broker, I threw out my opening rate. Let's see what happens. I hit submit on the load board within five minutes. Now I had this load posted for four days now. Within five minutes of posting a rate that was just average, my phone started blowing up. Elizabeth sits at a desk behind me. Her phone started blowing up. Just as fast as we could answer calls on a somewhat average rate. And I'll tell you what, nobody was negotiating. They wanted that load at that just subpar average, somewhat okay rate. So when I finally booked the load, I said, you know what? I know you would do it for such and such rate, but I'm going to give you $100 more. I'm going to give you more than you're asking for. I've got the money in it. I will give it to you. They didn't ask for it. There are a lot of carriers out there right now that are just jumping on any rate they can take. And I just discussed how they are in high demand. Brokers, in some cases, are having a hard time finding trucks. I was having a hard time. I had tried calling a couple of carriers to see, I'm trying to, this whole broker thing out. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I couldn't get a truck for it. For four days, I posted an average rate, and they're blowing my phone up. Why is that? Because they don't know what they're doing. I'm sorry, but as a broker, I'm telling you that carriers don't know what they're doing. And I'm here to help you with that. You have to be more aggressive. If a broker gives you a rate, and I can tell you that brokers might give you a, an opening rate of half of what you're willing to take it for. Don't hang up the phone on them. You have to counter. They, they, brokers know the market. They know what they, it will take to move the load. They know, but they know there's a lot of ignorant carriers out there that will take it for anything. It would be foolish for them to give them a, the, a great rate right off the bat as their initial offer. It's called negotiation. So when a broker posts a load with a rate, if that rate is low, that's all the more reason to call on it because there's probably a lot of negotiation room on that. There's more to it than just the rate. I guarantee it every time. Now, when a broker gives you a rate and they tell you that's all they have in it, there is a lot you can do. First of all, the comment I read earlier, the carrier had called the broker and got the details and asked what the rate was. And they said $800. And the carrier, their response to that was, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you anyway. And they were getting ready to say goodbye. And the broker said, wait, 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 wait. I just told you my story about being a broker. I couldn't find a truck. I was hoping that somebody would negotiate with me. This carrier wasn't going to negotiate. They were just going to say goodbye. That is so a wrong answer. It's not even funny. Now, I've experimented with this with a, with a couple of the loads that I've moved. And I've posted rates all over the board. I've posted really good rates. I've posted really bad rates. And I get the same response, no matter what. I, I posted rates that were, were ridiculously low. As a carrier, I, I would not haul it for that. My phone was still blowing up. I've posted rates that were, that were fantastic. My phone was blowing up. My it doesn't matter. There are carriers out there willing to work for just about anything. They want it easy. That brings me to another point. Why are you searching for loads based on the fact that they have a rate posted? Why is that what makes it easier for you? 
If you have another call, and I'm think I again I don't have a call screener, but if this is what spawned the call, this might be good. So it caller from the three two zero. Welcome to the show. Hey Kenny, it's Flynn in uh, Minnesota. Hey, nice it's, to have you. Uh, I know, like, hey, good to be on. I know it's been on my mind all week too, and I've been posted a few things. Like, uh, I, I'm I'm sort of mixed on this. What I've been doing, like, some if they don't if they have a rate and it's real low, I haven't called because uh, some of them that's just their, you know, it's like their anchor. Some I've called on, and it's been so far apart. I think one of the things that lets you know if, if there's room or not, because I called one uh, yesterday, and they wanted a reefer from, they wanted it frozen for a dollar fifty a mile. Okay. From uh, the can yeah, from the from uh, from Joplin to the uh, central Wisconsin area. You know, and my and my price is a lot higher, and they were the ones who were like. You know, well, we're too far apart on this, and you know, because they, you know, they're brokers. They they want to move on too if they're fantastically far apart. And then I gotta admit, I had one where I was in that boat of getting ready to hang up the phone too. Now I didn't get this load, and I because I'm taking a different one. They never called back either. But there was one that was like 150 miles and deliver the next day, and they wanted uh, and the and the and the broker said the shipper is around. Two hundred and twenty-five dollars, or something like that. So it wasn't even two bucks a mile, and it was a lot of time. Right. And I was about, and I was, you know, I was getting to hang up. I said, "Well, you know, your rate and mine are aren't that. That's not even in the same planet as I am." And then he's like, "Wait, wait, wait! Just could you give me your rate just in case, and then I may get some more money." And then I quoted, uh, you know, six hundred because it wasn't that many miles, and I'd be able to get going in the morning. But uh, I think that's one of the things, too, is when you do the offer, a counter, you know, their reaction is going to tell you if there's a little bit, if there's room or if, or if they're in that contract for lower rates and, and they either can't move or they think they'll get some sucker to take it for dirt. I mean, that, that's just what I've, I've been seeing in my limited three, week, three weeks of uh, – booking my own freight and you're right on all counts now that being said the reason that i wanted to do this show was we are in a point where the carrier is going to be in higher demand the carrier has the leverage in the negotiation use it absolutely use it now several times i have given rates that were just astronomically higher than than the broker had initially offered and there have been times when you know, we've parted ways and said, you know what, we're just too far apart. And there's been a lot of times when that broker will call back later and we'll make a deal on it with my rate because that's what it takes to get the load moved. So regardless of whether a rate is posted or not and regardless of whether or not is it is their anchor, if their anchor – now, here's the thing. I absolutely know why people like to call on posted rates. People like to walk into their grocery store – and pick up a gallon of milk and see the price sticker on that gallon of milk and know exactly what it's going to cost them to take that gallon of milk home because it makes them comfortable. The Western civilization, Americans, Canadians, uh, Europeans, they, uh, most of them are like that. When you get into other cultures, other countries, when I would spend my time in Iraq and Kuwait, uh, it's just not like that. Other cultures... Don't put prices on things. You're expected to haggle and negotiate. Uh, you're expected to. There are no prices. Nobody knows what anything costs. You, you haggle over everything. But because Americans are so firm on just seeing these price tags, if they see a gallon of milk and it's a few pennies too high, you see it with gas stations when you're in your four-wheeler. Maybe not so much in your, tr well, the truck too, but when you're in your car, if you see a gas station that's just a few pennies cheaper at one exit than you know it is at the next, you will... Uh, I've seen people drive. I've done it myself. You drive, you see that gas light on, you're worried you won't make it another block. But if you know that the gas at the next street is just a penny or two less, you'll try to make it there, right? Everybody does it because you know what that price is. It makes you more comfortable to know you're saving money. If the prices weren't out there and you knew you were out of gas, you would take the, the possibly take the more expensive one, right? 
people think they're getting a bargain just because they see the price posted. They think that because that, that rate is posted, that is the best rate they can get. And it's absolutely couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, um, when you see a posted rate in, in spot market loads, it's always up for negotiation. Give your counter offer. And if your counter offer is way too far apart, leave your offer, say thank you, leave your phone number, and I, and I guarantee you a pretty good percentage will call back. If your offer is fair, if your offer is just what they call a Japanese no, where it's so high that it's just ridiculous and, and it, it's your way of saying no, you don't want the load anyway, well, they probably won't get a call back. But if your offer is, is within reason and you could justify it yourself, not because of some bumper sticker that says don't haul cheap freight, but if you can justify it and say I need such and such per day and I have these costs and I know this load is going to take me so far and I know it's going to take me so long and then there's loading and unloading and tarping and, and whatever it is and you can logically put these numbers together in your head and say this is actually what it will take to move this load and the broker doesn't have it figured out, you leave your offer because if this is what takes you to move that load, it's what it will take most carriers to move the load if you're within reason and you'll get that call back. Now, I'm going to put you back on hold. We've got some background noise there, but I appreciate the call. And again, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and press one. The phone lines are open. I will get everybody on the air tonight. Now, that being said, brokers do know the market and they take advantage of it. Shippers know the market. They take advantage of it. Shippers have dozens of brokers they can call. Brokers have thousands of trucks they can call. They have the information. They know what it will take. They know the rates. They know the, the lanes. They know all of that because that's what they do. That's what they focus on. That's what they study. Maybe they sit there in their underwear with nothing but a computer and a telephone in front of them. What else do they have to do but study this stuff, right? So they know more than the carriers. So what is the weakest link in the negotiation process? The carrier, the trucker. The truckers, the carriers, those that are negotiating need to understand what they're getting into. That's why I'm telling you all right now, the market is strong. Say no to cheap freight. If it doesn't meet your requirements and if it doesn't, if the market justifies more and you know it does, move on. And if everybody starts doing that, rates will be where they need to be. Even if these brokers and so forth are locked into these long-term contracts, maybe they've shot themselves in the foot, they've underbid the market, and they need to go back and renegotiate. It happens all the time. And there's another possibility that we'll talk about here in a minute. And that, um, and that is how brokers bid their lanes, which most carriers, again, don't understand. We'll take another call here. Let's go to the 616 area code. Welcome to the show. Hi, this is Jenna, and I am just calling in regards to, for example, the company that I work for, I manage two trucks. Okay. And the incident that I had this morning was there was a load going from Pennsylvania going down to Miami and had about 1,200 miles. And it was picking up today, delivering Friday at noon, right? So I don't want to get my driver stuck on Friday. Right. Um, granted that it's really tough getting out of Florida. So I asked for 2400 and uh, I was working with the load board for, to be right. specific, see at Robinson. And the lady that I was working with, she basically was like, okay, I'll put in your offer. I'll call you back. And then she called me back and she's like, oh, sorry, that load went for like $2,000. Yes. What is the best way to negotiate in that scenario? And especially right now, maybe I'm just thinking that it's a little slow right now, but um, any additional information you can provide me with, I would really appreciate it. Okay. Well, there's a few things that are kind of working against us right now. Now, there, there's a lot of information to be found out there, but you have to be, you have to research it more than just on the surface. If you look at Florida right now and you do some searches in Florida, you'll find that actually Florida should be a pretty good market. If you look at the DAT uh, rate view uh, program, if you look at the breakdown on state by state, and it's, if you can zoom into the, the region, which will break it down even smaller than states, Florida right now is actually a little better than a three-to-one load-to-truck ratio, which is a good thing. But 
they're still not offering decent rates. And the reason why is most of those loads are still within the state of Florida. So if you get into Miami, for example, and I'm based in Orlando, so I absolutely know what you're talking about. If you get to Miami, getting out of Florida will still be tough, even though it's a good market. The problem is carriers typically don't look that far into it. Carriers are looking at, uh, and, and the brokers will tell them this and they will use it against them. They will look at this and say, hey, Florida's a great market right now, let's go there. And what they're doing is some carrier that was more ignorant than you decided that Florida would be great for $2,000. They went down there and they're going to have a rude awakening when they get there. They will have to still deadhead or take uh, you know, a dollar a mile out of Florida just to get out because that it really yep. should be you know, the rates that you had originally quoted. C.H. Robinson, their job is to find a cheap carrier to do it, and they did. And right now, that's, that is what I'm seeing right now. All of the, and I think there's some other factors as to why these numbers are, are skewed. All of the indicators are showing typically bad areas as hot right now. Southern Texas is showing pretty hot. But if you get down there with a van in Southern Texas in what should be a good market, it's hit and miss. It still is hit and miss, even though it's, the numbers are showing it's a good market. Part of the problem as well is even, even though the brokers are using the good market to lure carriers into a, that market cheap, they're flipping the script on them, especially places in like Florida. And they're, when you get there, they're saying, you're in Florida. I actually had a broker tell me this. You are in the absolute best place or worst place in the country to be. And I, I explained to them, well, that may be true, but you're going to have a real hard time getting this load move for that rate because there are more loads than trucks right now. And I, I am a Florida carrier. I will bounce around within Florida. So you're going to have to do better than that. And sure enough, they call back and they make it happen. But to get out of Florida is still cheap. And the market, and you have to look at the market closer than just some of these 30,000 foot views that the load board back office information gives you. You have to look at some trends, do some searches, do some calls on both sides of that to make sure that you can get in and out. And I know exactly what you're talking about. I have one of my owner operators. I had to have a discussion with them today about the same thing. They booked a load into South Florida because they thought it was a good rate per mile going in. But I explained to them, you have to add in your deadhead miles coming back out. And they just didn't factor that in as well. So having an open discussion with a broker is the best way to negotiate that and explain to them what the market is and what you're seeing and ask them what they're seeing and a lot of a lot of the brokers are, are using this information to their advantage but if you have if you understand it you can turn it around on them as well just having that discussion helps that being said the reason that I'm doing the show is you might explain it to them and they will say well I'm just gonna find somebody that's that's too dumb to understand how that works and move on now I have you know I, I always keep my notes here my, my, second page, my second line here says the power of no, the word no. There is no reason to go to South Florida. There are thousands of loads available. South Florida is always horrible. I don't care what the, the trend lines say or, or whatnot. That South Florida is always bad. You can always say no. Move on. Don't be afraid to give your rate and keep shopping. Okay. And I know that's not real specific. And, and I don't know if you're looking for a magic bullet, but right now it's going to take a lot of people to understand the market so that the carriers stop, stop moving it so cheap. When a carrier or a broker says, that's all I've got in it, and a carrier just caves and says, okay, then they get it moved cheap. But if the carrier gives their rate and says, this is what it'll take, and the broker starts calling around and can't find another truck, they'll have to call their customer and make that happen. So if you do that enough times, eventually you'll get the rates that you need. And if most carriers start doing that enough times, rates across the board, averages will start going up. And, and as much as I hate to admit it, I understand that that is really what the, the uh, intention behind that don't haul cheap freight bumper sticker is. Uh, overall, I don't agree with the, the idea behind it, but right now, that's what we need. Carriers need to understand the market, and they don't. And it's, it's killing all of us. Brokers are going to ride this wave as long as they can. Shippers are going to try to lock in contracts until the last minute, but it will reach a tipping point. And the sooner 
carriers start understanding the market they're in and understand the leverage they have, the sooner it will tip in our favor. That's what I'm hoping for, and that's what I want to start spreading that word. I want to light the, light the fire right now and hope it spreads like wildfire quick across the industry. If carriers start understanding and start realizing that we are back on top in these negotiations, we will start seeing a, a change. Now, it's, it might in the short term hurt brokers, but brokers will eventually go back to their customers. Customers will have to start to renegotiate, and all of us, the entire industry, will start making more. It's, it has to happen. And brokers, if they have underbid themselves and did not take the supply and demand into account, it, that's not our problem. So on the spot market, that's what we deal with. Now, the way the market is supposed to work, carriers are supposed to have their contract freight. This is how it was before deregulation. Carriers had their head haul. Brokers were only there for a backhaul. Well, the market has changed to where most carriers now, small, you know, especially the small carriers, they are using brokers for everything they do. And brokers are still treating it like backhauls each way. And that's why if you look at freight rates, you hear some of the guys that have been in this 30 and 40 years saying that the 30 years ago rates were where they're at now. And in some cases that's true because the, the market has shifted. And it, it's a positive and you know, the, a negative at the same time. The market has shifted and carriers don't have head alls anymore. Everything they get is from a broker, which can be good when the spot market is in our favor, but it, it hurts you when you're locked into a contract rate and you, and you just can't uh, get the backhaul that you need. And, and even that, that word gets people upset, the word backhaul. But uh, that's really how the market works. So my point is be aggressive in your negotiation. Don't accept an offer that's below your own standards. Know your own numbers. Push for that. Leave your offers and hope they call you back or move on and find a better lane for, for your operation. Does that help your, uh, and I know that's still not a specific answer, but does that somewhat explain what's happening? Yes, no, that was great. And sometimes like my thing is like, I do rely a lot on load boards and it just seems like there are less and less loads. So I'm just not sure if it's like, if it's the slow time of the year and I'm completely new to this. So this is why okay. I'm asking all these questions. So I, I appreciate you answering all these questions. Well, I will tell you right off the bat, this is the absolute slowest time of year. We're kind of coming to the end of that as we reach, you know, we progress through March. Once the frost, uh, well, it's been a mild winter, so that's a bad, <laughs> bad, uh, bad way to explain it. But once winter's behind us, once we get into the springtime freight, and I, I remember when I was driving, uh, you know, at least to a bigger carrier, that did hazmat once i started seeing pool chemicals moving again chlorine and stuff like that and then i started seeing lawnmowers move and then i started seeing the flatbeds moving the the landscape supplies and things like that that was always my indicator that spring is here freight market is about to kick off we're a few weeks early for that uh south florida some of the plants are starting to move the live plants the nurseries in uh, florida and georgia are getting ready to start shipping and even some of the nursery customers i have up as far north as uh, virginia are they're starting to to uh, get the plants packaged up ready to ship so we're getting there but it'll be a couple more weeks so this is is by far this is the slowest period of the year but even so we're seeing spikes in certain markets and certain segments so that and and i want everybody to take advantage of those spikes and when the market flips in our favor which will be in just a few weeks we everybody needs to be on top of that and ready for that and not accepting low rates just because they, they think it's the, the norm. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you for the call. And I just want to reiterate, be aggressive. When you're negotiating, throw out rates that make you cringe. That is, uh, that's really th the biggest number you can say with a straight face. That, is, that should every time be your counteroffer. Maybe they will laugh at you. Maybe they will flinch, cringe back. That's the, absolutely the type of reaction you want. If you throw out a rate and they say, eh, okay, it's, it, your late was, rate was just way too low. You need to throw out a rate where they are just thrown back. They have no idea where that came from. 
That's how you negotiate. Be very aggressive. We are getting into a market, and we're not quite there yet, but we're real close. And we are in a market that would allow for that. Be aggressive when you negotiate. Let's see. We will go to area code 434. Welcome to the show. Hello, sir. Hey, you did not. Fantastic. How can we help you? Listen, I'm calling on behalf of the truck moving equipment and moving uh, pie trucks, uh, dump trucks, class A trucks, uh, whether it be used or new. And what I'm looking into is, uh, do I have? Do I need to have a USDOT number? Do I need to have it as I am the occupant? You know, more or less running a, a company, or because I'm driving somebody else's air and producing shit and all. Okay. I'm trying to find out which way to go on this thing. All right. So explain to me what you want to do. With this you're, you're going to get. You're you're going to buy the truck, and then what will you be doing with it? No, 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 sir. I'm oh, okay. not buying the truck. I'm just working for a company that moves the trucks from point A to point B. Somebody has bought it in oh, uh, okay. Atlanta, and it is located in uh, Philadelphia. Gotcha. And it needs to get from point A to point B. They will contact this movie you cover. Okay. How would you, I mean, do you have to have a USDOT? Yes. Now, you just, you're you're going out and picking up these vehicles, or you actually work for another company that is contracted to do this? Actually, I'm talking to a company that's doing it, okay. and, and I'll be just working through them. Okay. All right. So here's how it works. That is called a drive-away operation. All right. So drive-away is you go out, you, you pick up the truck, you drive it to the location. You absolutely do have to have a DOT number and an MC number for that. And when you pick up the truck, it, you'll pick it up. It'll be completely blank. It won't have any stickers on the door, no names. You need to get some signs made up that have your name and and DOT number listed on them and stick them to the side of the truck while it's in transit. So yes, you do have to get your, your authority or the company that you're working for needs to have their authority. But it's called drive away and it is absolutely uh, part of interstate commerce and you do have to have authority to do it, which is a DOT number and an MC number. Okay. So if they have the DOT and motor carrier number, you know, I go over to them, I, don't, well, I if, still have to file it because I'm getting a contract, I'm getting paid for it. Well, you are working for them, correct? Are you a, are you working for them, or are you a contractor, and they're they're essentially brokering to you? So there's two relationships I, here. I'd they could either... be working for them more or less. Okay. If there's two ways that this could work, you work for them, and when you go to pick up the truck, it's you said it's on their insurance, correct? Yeah, I'm going to run okay. under their insurance policy if, and if their number. If you are under their insurance, then it will be their motor carrier number. You will essentially be either a contractor or employee. Uh, in this situation, you should be classified as an employee. But you will go there, and you will put their name and their number on the, on the doors. So you don't have to do it because they will essentially be the carrier. So it would be no different than if you went to work with uh, any yep. other carrier and you drove their truck. The, it, it's their even though you are getting paid as a driver, it is their authority and their name on the door. In this case, you, you're just going to pick up another truck yeah. that, yeah. So it, that's the way it works. They will need to have their authority and their MC number. When you go to pick up the truck, you should put signs on the door that have their name and the DOT number on them. Okay. So if I do it, I'm more or less, if I decide that I want to pick up something and, and move it, just say... LTL freight, a pallet, I tag a band behind, behind me. I decide I want to pick up a pallet and move to the next truck, maybe a pallet. Okay, now now we're getting into a whole new new operation. Um, if you're still doing it under their authority, then it's still their authority. Now, if the truck has their name on it and it's under their insurance, you can't use it for your business. You can't use it to go pick up a pallet that you get paid for. That would actually be illegal. Uh, you'd have to, yep. they would have to arrange the freight, they would have to do the billing, and it would all have to go through them. Yeah. But like I said, if, if I was tagging a vehicle, say I pick up a uh, bucket truck. 
Okay. Cheer your power company. And I tag my van behind it. All right. And I get to you the destination that the bucket truck will be delivered. Right. I disconnect the uh, van, and now that's fine. Now, if I want to move it, they say, well, you know, we get this. This other truck is about 200 miles away. Okay. And I got a van, and I look on the blow board, and there's a, uh, there's a load of flour or cotton soil. Gotcha. And they have to go to a little shop 150 miles in direction. Gotcha. I will have to have my motor carrier number to do that, right? Well, if we're talking about just a passenger van, you know, cargo van, you're going to be under the 20 or the 10,000 pound weight rating. So in that case, you would need a DOT number. You would not necessarily need an MC number. Uh, if you were to do something that was heavier where it was over 10,000 pounds, you would also need a D, uh, an MC number, your authority. In either case, you still have to have the insurance, and your van would have to have your name and DOT number on it. Okay. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. I need yeah. to find it out if I wanted to do that. And just, you know, to get me started, I'm in a dead neck of the woods. Um, there's no trucks around. I can use the van to do what I need to do, get where I can get some freight, and be making money at the same time. Yes, but you would have to have your DOT and MC number on it, depending on the, the weight rating. You'd be right there. Uh, some of the you know, the sprinter vans and things, some of those get into the where they're right at that limit where they would need an MC number. But in any case, you would have to have your own authority, be it just a DOT number or an MC number, uh, and you'll have to look up the regulations on and your van and your weight ratings and all that. That's You're right at the limit where you probably may get away without an MC number. You might need it if you're over the 10,000 pounds. Uh, if you are over 10,000 pounds, you get your authority, and you will have to have your uh, name and DOT number on the door of your van. You will have to have the $750,000 of, uh, of liability insurance, and any customer will probably require you to have cargo insurance. But you will have to have that. You can't use the insurance of the carrier that you are going, you know, pulling the van out there with, the, doing the drive away. No, 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 no. I was just trying to, you know, I was trying to look at it as an option right. where I wouldn't have to be a uh, city. I mean, you know, if I moved it and there's nothing in that area and I want to continue making money and if I hit that book behind me, yeah, I know I'd have to have my insurance and DOT number. I was trying to figure out how to work at that I could use that like that. Yes, it could work. It, I can't imagine that it would be cost effective to do it that way. Maybe uh, if you find the right insurance policy, uh, it might be something else. But um, you might be able to do okay with that if you do the do the research. Yeah. And because of the the size of the vehicle and everything, you might be able to find a decent insurance policy to cover you. Usually, that type of thing is pretty expensive. But if you can find that, it could absolutely work. Uh, but that would be the legalities of how it would have to work. Oh, yeah, there's always catch twenty two, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yes. So, all right, yeah, sir. And like I said, I was just doing a little research, looking into the background on that. Yep, that and that would be how it works. So, I appreciate the call. We are at the top of the hour. Let me go through the comments on Facebook. There's been a few. There's been a few things that they're discussing here on the Facebook feed, and I'll just I'll bring this up. Um, all right, so somebody's asking about getting brokerage authority. To get brokerage authority is the exact same application that you fill out to get your carrier authority. The insurance requirements are really the only difference. You fill out the application, and a, a carrier requires $750,000 of public liability insurance. That's it. That could be very expensive in the beginning. They need to file their process agents or BOC3 form. As a broker, you also have to file your BOC3 and instead of public liability insurance, you have to post a bond. Now what that bond would cover is any carrier that you hire, if for some reason you go out of business or you don't pay them or what or whatnot, they can file against the bond to get their freight bill paid. Now that bond has to be $75,000 and there's a few options for that. You can put the $75,000 up as a trust. You can get a bank to finance it, give you basically give you a letter of credit, a loan for $75,000. You can finance it through an insurance company and, or get an insurance company to post this bond for you for a monthly fee or payments. Um, 
or you can just finance it through your bank, uh, not with a letter of credit, but just uh, make payments that way. So once you do that, it's either the, B, uh, the BMC 85 or the 84, depending on if it's a trust fund or if it's an actual bond. And there's pros and cons to each. Of course, if you actually put up the $75,000 cash, that's actually the most secure way to do it, but may not be the most affordable way. Of course, most people don't have $75,000 cash. The be next best way would be to get a letter of credit from your bank. Usually that is the most affordable way to finance it. Uh, and then of course, all the insurance companies offer their programs as well. They usually will check your credit and that will have a major factor. And there are a lot of companies that won't check your credit, but it can be very, very expensive. So typically a new broker could get started for under $5,000 a year, but that would be a recurring cost typically every year. And you're still retreated as a new broker that doesn't give you actual cargo cover, uh, excuse me, doesn't give you any insurance coverage. So if a carrier that you hire gets into some type of an accident, you will be in the chain of uh, people that get sued. So you should still have insurance on top of that, but those are just the minimum requirements. So that's how you get started as a broker. And Okay, there was a discussion about co-brokering. Now, this one is interesting. Co-brokering can go both ways. Many people get co-brokering and double brokering confused. Double brokering is completely illegal uh, under MAP21. A carrier cannot broker a load. Now, I mentioned that I started my brokerage to handle the overflow from my carrier. But now all of my customers are billed and routed through my, care, my, my brokerage first. So my brokerage can take that freight and, get, and put it on any carrier they choose, including the one that I own. That's what I typically do is put the freight that my direct customers on my own trucks. If I can't get one of my own trucks to cover it, I broker it to somebody else. A carrier, when I was only a carrier, I had more freight than I could move. I was not allowed to give that freight to a broker and have them move it for me. Because now I'm taking it, I'm giving it to a broker, and that broker is brokering it. That's double brokering. That's illegal. So a, you have to be a broker to broker freight. Now, the other one is co-brokering. <coughs> I mentioned that I'm a new broker. One of the problems I have as a new broker is, well, there's a few problems. One, carriers don't like to work with me as a new broker. I don't have a credit score yet. It's not that I have bad credit. I don't have credit. When you pull my carrier records up, there's a blank line there. When I post a load on, on the load board, where all the other brokers have a little check mark that they're, they have good credit or their days to pay is listed or whatever, I have a blank line. I'm brand new. And it may take a long time to establish a credit score of some sort. That's a negative for me. So when I mentioned that I posted my load the first few days, I did not get a call on it. That could have been one of the major reasons why I didn't get a call on it. Now, one of the options I could do is co-broker. So I could call one of the big freight brokers out there. Now, I made the sales call. These are my customers. I, I bill the customers. I, I handle the loads. I handle the shipments. If I can't find a truck because I'm a new broker, what do I do? I can call one of the big brokers or a broker that's been in business for years. And I can talk to that broker and say, hey, look, I have this customer. I can't get a truck to cover it. Help me out. This big broker can say, okay, I'll do that. Let me broker it for you. Now, I can take the, the fee of what that broker might charge. I can get a little out of it. Now, although I'm giving it to another broker, I have expenses incurred. I've made the sales call. I am paying for that bond we talked about. I'm paying for the insurance. I have expenses. I still have to do the billing. I still have to flow that money through to the new broker. If the customer doesn't pay me, I still have to pay this other broker. So I'm taking a lot of risk as the initial broker. But... The second broker is also taking, taking risk. All the risks that I have, they're taking the same risk for the carrier. The carrier is willing to trust that new broker with their credit score, and that, that broker is willing to trust me. So that's one possibility for co-brokering, and it's absolutely a good option for co-brokering. 
Many of the bigger carriers focus on warehouse to warehouse freight. And frankly, it's cheap freight. They have 100 loads a day to move and they'll move them as cheap as possible. My customers are premium customers. I have a small carrier and I have premium customers with premium freight rates. So if I can get that second carrier or second broker to help me move that load, chances are the end carrier will still get a better rate. Okay, so, and somebody asked, uh, going back to adding brokerage authority to your carrier. Under MAP21, these are supposed to be separate. Now, technically, the way it's worded, you could start a broker under the same company name. It would be the same, same, uh, same DOT number. They will give you an additional MC number, brokerage authority under a different MC number, but you will have the, the everything could be the same. Problem is, if you set it up that way, nobody will insure you. You will, your insurance company will drop you as a, on the carrier side. Chances of finding one of these companies to finance the bond on the broker side is slim. So, under Map 21, because of the issue with co with double brokering, not co-brokering, but double brokering, insurance companies don't want to take that risk. And I'll explain what that risk is in a minute, and I'll explain why it's illegal. So both of these uh, businesses have to be kept separate. They should be both under a separate corporation, separate company names, even to the point that they should be at separate addresses and owned by separate people. So you have to be very careful with that because insurance companies will look and say, hey, yeah, they're under separate names with the state, but they're still operated exactly the same. You're still doing the same thing. The reason they're doing that is they do not want double brokering. Now, how does double brokering work? I own a brokerage and I own a carrier. I own both. My carrier has direct customers. My direct customer has more loads than I can handle, so I give it to my broker side to broker it out. Well, the, the shipper thinks that it's going on my truck. They have my insurance on file. Now I broker it. They, I've double broke. Even though I own the carrier and I own the broker, I've just double brokered inside my own company. Now, the shipper thinks that my carrier insurance is covering his freight. And the company that I broker this out to thinks that their insurance is covering the freight. And when there's a loss, the carrier of record does not match either insurance policy on what actually happened. So the shipper and the carrier could be in a huge legal battle. And it could turn into a, a real nightmare. And it has. There's been several legal battles, you know, uh, issues with this. And that's why it's become a, a, a legality on just keeping everything separate. All right. And I think that's the gist of everything that's going on here on Facebook. I will I will uh let that go from there. All right. So everybody, thank you all for joining me. We have gone into overtime. I appreciate it if you are following me on Facebook or live on the phones tonight. I wish you all a great year. I know that that it's a little discouraging right now, but things are really starting to pick up and it will it I'm just looking forward to what's to come this summer. It's going to be fantastic. So gear up for it, be ready for it. Practice your negotiation skills. Stay on top of the market. Start paying real close attention to the trends. Stay pay real close attention to inbound and outbound ratios, load to truck ratios. Look at all this stuff, study this before you dispatch yourself. Your rates right now should be well above average. We should be on the upswing and, and I'm still seeing things ticking down. But freight volumes are up, so we should start seeing rates to, uh, to go up with it. So everybody, remember to aim high and dream big, strategize your plan, and earn your success. Good night, everybody. And Facebook, you are still with me. I have ended the call-in segment of the show.
and keep up the uh, conversation there on Facebook. A lot of people are still commenting. Keep that going. And I will be watching throughout the night. And for everybody that joined me here and took the time out of your night to spend with me, thank you all very much. And we will see you again next week.